I didn't think I'd have to make this video, or let me rephrase, I hoped I wouldn't have to make this video, and I suppose in theory I still don't, but I feel like it's something worth talking through whether it comes to pass or not, because you see, Last year, I did an RCR stories on the history of Cash for Clunkers and how it ended up being one of the worst ideas in the history of ever. Regardless of how well-intentioned it might have been, it still led the used car market down a grim path. Some true gems were getting sent to the scrap heap, and for what? To speed up the process for people who were going to buy a new car anyway? A process that resulted in a bunch of upfront sales and then declining numbers in the years that followed? Sure, yeah, sure, you get a check in your hand, but in the grand scheme of things, there are generally fewer people capable of owning a car at all because they can't afford to buy new without setting up 72-month financing on a bank account that's an ass hair away from being overdrawn. All while perfectly functioning used cars and classics alike are junked, arbitrarily inflating the prices of the more recent used cars that remain. This is the automotive equivalent of the Dark Phoenix Saga. You're never going to get it right, so please stop trying. Just a quick reminder to, you know, maybe those who aren't in the know. The car allowance rebate system, colloquially known as Cash for Clunkers, was a 2009 program that incentivized trading in old vehicles built after 1984 with fuel economy below 18 miles per gallon, in exchange for a voucher in the ballpark of between 2500 and 4500 for a new car. The intended purpose was to junk these cars and take them off roads altogether, with the goal of being environmentally friendly, getting newer cars on the road, stimulating the economy, and creating more jobs. All that good stuff politicians want to be applauded for doing. You know, pass the savings on down to you, the consumer. Except, that didn't really happen. I mean, it was great if you were Honda, Hyundai, or Toyota, since Cash for Clunkers got people buying a bunch more Camrys, Civics, Corollas, and Elantras, but the so-called clunkers of today aren't exactly unwanted, because, well, they're all those Camrys, Civics, Corollas, and Elantras that were purchased new way the hell back in 2009, back when you used your sliding phone to post statuses on Facebook in the third person. Hell, the clunkers of yesteryear were hardly unwanted either, considering what some of those junked models go for on Bring a Trailer. People were sold a false bill of goods, thinking that they were going to get a really good discount on new cars, only to realize that the rebate didn't really make up the difference in the cost of the new car, and that loans and financing options had to be applied. I mean, if you wanted to do this program again, you'd probably have to tighten the fuel economy and age restrictions since so many of the so-called junkers on the road are under 25 years old and get better fuel economy than their 2009 equivalents. It would be to the point where the cars that could be purchased would be prohibitively expensive, rendering a voucher towards the purchase of a newer vehicle unworthy of the paper it's printed on. But enough preamble. What's really going on here? Is this happening? Well, at the risk of revealing I've deployed clickbait like one of those channels whose thumbnails are 90% arrows and red circles, the truth is that this is all just rumor at this point, but not without origin from plausible sources, which I'll cite along the way. On April 2nd, an article was released by Bloomberg titled, Ford sees talks with U.S. on cash for clunkers like stimulus, in which Mark Leneve, Ford's vice president of marketing, sales, and service, spoke out about the company's hopes for a stimulus similar to the plan put into place in 2009, telling the publication, quote, Cash for clunkers was very effective at that time. It would be nice to think we could have something equally as effective for 2020 when we get out of this, because it was a great program, end quote. Now, what's interesting about this view is that while Ford may have benefited from cash for clunkers, you could argue that it had a lower threshold for success considering Ford didn't have to be bailed out when the industry was collapsing back then. You see, they secured their survival through private loans, but Leneve speaks in favor of a stimulus that would amount to a bailout for Ford, which closed its North American factories indefinitely in March. Leneve states, quote, we think some level of stimulus somewhere on the other side of this would help not only the auto industry and our dealers, which are a huge part of our overall economy, but will help the customers as well. We're in discussions about what would be the most appropriate. 
End quote. So, what is the nature of these discussions? Well, Ford's world headquarters and research development buildings, in addition to their Flat Rock assembly plant, are in Michigan's 12th Congressional District, which is represented by Debbie Dingle, who recently claimed that a Cash for Clunkers type initiative is one of the many ideas on the table. She even claims that the state government has been, quote, working with the entire ecosystem of automakers, workers, their unions, suppliers, dealers, and consumers, end quote presumably towards coming up with a solution. Granted, for all anyone knows, there could end up being a completely different solution on the table than yet another scrappage program, but it seems clear what type of solution Ford is hoping for. And yet, what would even be the hypothetical game plan here? Adam Jonas, the auto analyst for Morgan Stanley, had a recent interview with financial publication Barron's, now, in this interview, he compares the current situation to the first Cash for Clunkers in 2009, when the $3 billion package stimulated roughly $14 billion in purchases. Here, he anticipates a second Cash for Clunkers would take a $10 billion package and stimulate $50 billion in purchases, and would keep factories open in swing states and other important manufacturing sectors like Alabama... Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Mississippi, Ohio, Tennessee, and Texas. People remain employed, consumers buy new cars, the economy gets a booster shot, and everyone can comfortably get their nut without having to think of the building receptionist. But how would the stimulus potentially work this time around? Jonas explains, quote, These are numbers more for discussion. A $5,000 coupon to scrap a car subject to a variety of criteria, including U.S. local content percentages. Call it 60% U.S. content. So there's an American domestic angle that will of course include Japanese and Korean cars produced in the U.S. There may be some household income limitations, and then limitations on the kind of vehicle you can scrap. And then how much you can buy. It might have a $60,000 maximum price limitation. It's going to be designed, we think, to support lower and middle income classes to get bipartisan support. Also, there will be a fuel economy and a sustainability angle to it. The fuel economy of the car bought, we suspect, will be 50% better than the fuel economy of the car scrapped. By getting rid of those old clunkers, you're getting rid of the least efficient cars on the road, too. And then there's a safety element to it. Some level of minimum driving assistance technology. So the car you're scrapping versus the car you're buying has a life-saving element to it, which would get some support. When we run the math on that, you get some interesting paybacks because you're stimulating factories. You're creating sales tax for states that are in pretty dire straits. You're creating registration fees while saving fuel and lives and insurance. That's kind of how the pitch will be. End quote. And look, in a way, I can almost understand the rationale, except for the insane amount of pushback I anticipate from people who don't feel like being babysat by driving assistance technology, all in the name of short-term gains from a program that may or may not actually do what it's supposed to do. I mean, a post-mortem on Cash for Clunkers by the Brookings Institution found that the national GDP was boosted by roughly $2 billion and 2,050 jobs. Except, the program costs roughly $1.4 million per job created. And it's theorized you could have gotten better results through far less expensive avenues, such as reducing payroll tax for employers and employees, or, big shock here, I know, but bear with me, increasing unemployment benefits. You can lay out a program like this, but what's it going to matter if it's executed with all the grace of two bears railing each other on a pair of rollerblades? Oh yeah, let me get that 84-month deal with 20% APR and no payments for the first six months. Also, I can drive a Chevy Equinox. I mean, come on. We can do better than this. And look, even if you somehow had 0% interest, sure, that'd be good for the consumer, I guess, but wouldn't it be kind of bad for the businesses you'd presumably be trying to save? It'd sort of be like reopening movie theaters but not letting them sell concessions. To this end, Jonas theorizes it'd be something akin to natural selection for the brick-and-mortar retail side of the auto industry, with the idea being that the modernizing benefits of a second cash for clunkers would be worth it. 
Quote, We came up with a list. Less commuting, less car rental, younger cars, fewer dealers, more digital and touchless service. Restructured supply chains to reduce geographic dependence. Possibly less ride-sharing. You know, the whole concept of hygiene and who the prior rider was in a ride-sharing or pooling operation, or in a car rental operation, or even in the used car business, might take on an elevated importance for some time to come. When you think about car dealers, there are so many unpleasantries about the experience from the consumer side. That's even if you feel that you were getting a fair price. It's just got to change. It might be wishful thinking, but I'm kind of hopeful that one of the silver linings here is that this could accelerate a better experience. The things that a well-capitalized, publicly traded car dealer can do, the average mom-and-pop car dealer may not be able to or willing to do. So it's possible that you might have fewer dealers over time, but also a better experience for car buyers. End quote. Of course, at a time where businesses of all sizes are falling down into the Stygian abyss, this isn't really the best rhetoric to be putting out there, but it's all in service of trying to affix meaning to all this suffering, to give some sort of purpose to all this hardship we're enduring. Because it all has to be for something, right? Jonas states, quote, Think of all the lives lost and all the economic loss. Is it all in vain? Can this be a moment where the car companies and policymakers work together, or at least coordinate some kind of industrial policy? Because without that, what I fear is that if the auto industry loses the next two or three years due to economic shock, then we take a business that's important for employment and national security, and we take its chances of being relevant in the global mobility market long term, and we reduce it substantially. I'm thinking back to programs like the Highway Act, or Manhattan Project, or the Space Program. These types of things that we used to do in our country that had all sorts of tertiary benefits to important industries like cars, tech, and healthcare. I'm just wondering, when we get past putting out the fires here, can we actually have a more thoughtful 10 or 20 year approach to things like electric vehicle infrastructure, battery manufacturing, renewable energy, high speed rail, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, autonomous cars, like putting it all together? Can we rise to the occasion? End quote. You know, this this sounds like the equivalent of stimulating the adult film industry by outlawing recreational sex. Or, more accurately, it's akin to the Parable of the Broken Window by French economist Frédéric Bastiat. You know, the old fallacy that if you break a window, or a bunch of windows, the economy would be stimulated by all the people paying to have their windows fixed. And yet, in perhaps the most succinct summation of why Cash for Clunkers doesn't really work, Bastiat stated, quote, Society loses the value of things which are uselessly destroyed, and we must assent to a maxim which will make the hair of protectionists stand on end. To break, to spoil, to waste is not to encourage national labor, or, more briefly, Destruction is not profit. End quote. And hey, maybe there's a way to do this without screwing the used car market again. I'm not an economist, but it seems that in the short term, a car that you can maybe get for a thousand dollars used will end up costing a whole hell of a lot more on the other side of another scrappage program, especially since we're only now just getting back to the point where used cars are somewhat reasonably priced. In this current situation, people are traveling far less, since it's not as if people were being ordered to stay home in 2009 like they are now. People are being encouraged not to go out unless absolutely necessary. I mean, seriously, the, the sad fact here is that a lot of people are out of work, so you're stimulating the economy by getting people to buy something they don't actually have any sort of use for right now? You can't even hide behind the argument that this will be good for the environment since the stay-at-home orders are probably helping the environment more than encouraging a bunch of people to buy new cars would anyway. Even if it made sense to buy new cars right now, people are being actively encouraged not to drive them anywhere except maybe to the grocery store once a week. 
Makes sense for the essential workers to have a dependable ride, but even then, if their car is already dependably getting them where they need to go, it probably doesn't make financial sense for them to trade up at a time like this. But screw it, let's play devil's advocate and look at another argument for why maybe this isn't the worst idea in the world. A 2012 report by MIT argued that cash for clunkers didn't actually harm the used car industry or consumers to the extent that was popularly suggested. Quote, we find no evidence that the Cash for Clunkers program, by scrapping 700,000 used vehicles, increased the prices of low fuel economy, old, high mileage vehicles. We reach this conclusion by comparing the market prices of vehicles that were similar to vehicles commonly used as Cash for Clunkers trade ins with the prices of vehicles that were unlikely to be used as Cash for Clunkers trade ins. When we analyze the price paths for these two groups of cars during and after the end of the program, we find no systematic differences, suggesting that the destruction of vehicles had little effect on the used vehicle market. We conjecture that owners, in the absence of the Cash for Clunkers program, would have continued to hold their used vehicles for some time." End quote. Of course, with all this having been said, you could make the case that a used car today is of a generally higher standard than a used car from 2009, owing to any of a number of technical and mechanical upgrades. Even if the styling is uninspired, the argument is that today's presumed clunkers are generally more reliable than the clunkers of 2009. Despite the fact that, according to IHS Market, the average age of a current used car is around 12 years old, which is higher than the 10.3 years of 2009. As explained by IHS Market's Director of Global Automotive Aftermarket, Mark Seng, quote, the quality is higher, lasting longer, withstanding the weather, end quote. But it all comes back to jobs. Yeah, people were unemployed in 2009, but if anything, that should be a bellwether of what to expect if you try to do this sort of program again. The situation is more volatile, because people can't really afford a loan or a financing plan to make up the difference of what the rebate doesn't cover. This doesn't take into account any of a number of other concerns regarding the economy, whether it's student loan debt, medical bills if you wind up getting sick, or pre-existing payments on a car that might not even be close to paid off. As I mentioned last year in the RCR stories about this, a finding by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York showed that roughly 7 million Americans were 90 days or more behind on their car payments. That's worse than the 2008 recession, and that was only last year. I mean, it's hard to imagine a second pass at the car allowance rebate system would help matters in the long term. If anything, it would almost feel like a tax on the poor. We also have to remember why the first Cash for Clunkers cost taxpayers so much money, because, you see, the reason the original stimulus was $3 billion is because the intended $1 billion package was exhausted inside of a month, prompting the government to invest another $2 billion of taxpayer dollars into the program, only for that to be gone in around three weeks. Sure, some people bought new cars, and even new jobs were created, but not anywhere near as many as anticipated, in either respect. Like Cash for Clunkers 1, this potential second stimulus, stimuli, what am I doing, uh, would likely only help if you're already in the market and you've got good credit. Everyone else would probably be better served just keeping the cars they already own, which I suppose indirectly hurts the used car market again, since those cars aren't going to be available, even at inflated prices. But if your Honda Accord still has juice left in her, and the alternative is going into spectacular debt to not drive a Ford Fusion because you have nowhere to drive it, then what's the point? I mean, isn't 2020 bad enough? <laughs> you know what I mean? I think I'm just going to go in a cryostasis until this year is over. But until then, thanks for listening. Um, let me know what you think about this in the comments, because really, I'm just, I'm just frustrated because I don't really know what the goal is here, because it feels like we're getting short-term gains, and it's like cutting off your nose to spite your face, but in a far more violent style. 
It's like letting a back alley plastic surgeon cut off your nose. It's like you're not even doing it yourself. Like at the risk of deploying manifest ignorance, I'm keeping my car. As utterly basic as she is, I'm keeping her. Because a trade-in just doesn't make sense for me. And I don't know, maybe it will for you. Maybe you have something that is very, that's only worth like maybe a thousand dollars and you might be able to, you know, take the rebate and go buy something that's similar and you're just getting a newer version of that car, not necessarily like a new, new car. But even then, from a cost-benefit analysis standpoint, with registration fees and some dealers not even wanting to do the paperwork. I mean, like, what What are... I guess my, a lot of my complaints are predicated on the notion that this will be exactly like 2009, which is almost impossible for it to be exactly the same, because I, I want to believe that nobody's that stupid. But again, there's no way to know. And again, this is all just conjecture at this moment. That's all that I really know about this. Just let me know what you think about all this. I mean, there are two sides to every story, and if you want to argue in favor of this, I would love to hear it. I would love to read it. I would love to sort of just see differing viewpoints, even if it's just from a devil's advocate perspective, you know? But ultimately, thank you for listening, and uh, I'll see you when I'm out of cryostasis. Have a good one.